Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us. I presume everybody's online now that can. Um, so just a quick introduction. My name's Kevin Nine. I'm the chair of the Cork Society, and I'm just going to be the host today. So I'm just conscious of everyone's time. So we'll get straight into the presentation there now shortly. So there's going to be an opportunity for questions at the end. So if you do have any questions, just please submit them during the session. I'll put them to Michael at the end. You'll see a Q&A box at the bottom, so we'll be able to see those. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, which is Michael Farrell. So Michael's a lecturer in accounting in Cork University Business School, which is part of UCC. He's also a chartered accountant. He's worked in both practice and industry as well as lecturing. And he's also a member actually of our committee here at the Cork Society. So with that, I'm going to pass you over to Michael and I'll let you take it away. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Just going to share my screen here now. OK, so the title of this is Organizational and Dexterity Interpreting Theory for Practice. Again, as Kevin said, Michael Farber, the KPMG Lecturer in Accounting in Cork University Business School. And at the outset, I'm just going to say that this is going to be unashamedly high level broad thinking. OK, so one of the things we are talking about in the society is that we're hopefully going to use maybe these high level discussions, broad overview to actually inform later presentations and uh, later talks that get into the more nuances of, you know, uh, finance functions, innovations. We'll talk more about that at the very end of the webinar. So for now, it's a case of just sit back and think from a high level what this means to you. And hopefully then later on and then over the next couple of months, we can actually talk a bit more about operationalizing all of all of these, these things that I'm going to be talking about. So the first thing we're going to look at then is uh, in terms of creative destruction. OK, so if you looked at the Fortune 500 from 60 years ago, there's only about 10 to 15 percent of those companies actually remain. So like just three companies I picked out, John Deere, IBM, Whirlpool, they're all brands that people are going to recognize. Now, if you're looking at this from a positive point of view, you might say, OK, this type of turnover, it's a positive sign of economic dynamism and innovation. But try saying that to the companies who actually failed. OK, and what you've got to look at is what is there any underlying thing that's causing these organizations over time to actually fail? And what we focus on, what I'm primarily interested in, is some researchers attribute the long-term success of these companies to their ambidextrous capabilities, okay? So we're going to go through that. We're going to talk about what ambidexterity is, what people say it is, what it isn't, and then we'll move towards kind of more accounting-related stuff when we talk about performance measurement systems and what we're seeing there. So there's a lot of things to take in from this. The management side of ambidexterity is one thing, but also the accounting element as well. I'm going to try and make the presentation as broad as possible to every person. It doesn't matter if you're working in a large, large organization, small organization, if you're in practice, big or small. There's lessons here that everyone can gather, and I think it's... Um, it, for me, it's been a very interesting kind of construct in terms of that it might seem high level to you, but it's actually quite operational as well. OK, it doesn't require much work to actually get this thing going either. So what is it then? Ambidexterity, people would know it as the ability to use the right hand and the left hand equally well. But for organizations, ambidexterity is being efficient today, but adaptable for tomorrow. So your kind of left and right hand, two opposing tasks with the way people call, talk about it. So the problem here straight off is this appears to be a contradiction. How can you be efficient and flexible at the same time? OK, and the fundamental thing at the core of ambidexterity, it's removing an either or. I can either be one or the other and fostering a both and mindset. So one of the things that would be people would be critical of traditional accounting systems and traditional kind of thoughts is that you can either have one or the other. You can't have both. Now, the problem with that is when I suppose the reason a lot of people would have said in the past that you can't have both is it creates tensions. It creates prob other problems. But a lot of researchers have looked at this and said, well, OK, yeah, look, trying to get both create tensions and problems. But none of these tensions and problems are that big a deal in comparison to the organization failing. So the ability, I suppose, if you wanted to say that everyone is happy, everyone knows what they're doing, everything is kind of slow and easy, like there's no kind of conflicts or anything like that, that might seem great in the short term, but long term it's going to bring you down. There has to be some level of tension. There has to be some level of conflict. So we've moved forward here in thinking that actually, you know, it's not a case of having one or the other. You can try and have both, and it's tough to have both, but you can do it. So continuing on with what is it, like 
ambidexterity then, when we refer to it in terms of innovation, okay, so a lot of people have a broad defini definition of innovation, but there's actually two big sides to it. There's exploitation, which is efficiency, refinement. Best example you'll ever get here, and I'll kind of give you a good example in a minute to explain what this is, but then you've also got exploration, which is experimentation and risk-taking. So ambidexterity is about exploiting and exploring. They're the two things. Some people call them incremental innovations, radical innovations, okay? And that is the kind of crux of what ambidexterity tries to do. And this whole concept can apply to no matter what function you're in, no matter what type of organization, exploitation, exploration can apply. So don't just talk about we're innovating. You have to say, well, what type of innovation are you doing? So an example would be, best example I always kind of start with is Apple. Apple years ago came out with the iPhone. Now that was what we would call true exploration. It was a radical innovation for Apple. Brand new, never been done before from them, delivered it. That's an example of exploration working. But since they released the first version of the iPhone, there's been numerous versions of the iPhone ever since. And the way we would look at that as researchers is they're exploiting that technology. They're trying to get incremental benefits. They're trying to make the iPhone bit better. They're trying to refine it, okay? But it's no longer, it's never going to be as radical as it was when it first came in, okay? So that's kind of broadly saying where we are with these things. And look, there is massive overlap between them. I can take those in the quick Q&A afterwards, but we're really saying that you need both to be ambidextrous. Okay. Now, one of the problems with trying to achieve both, and you might be thinking about this already, is there's always going to be a bias towards exploitation. No matter what you do, you're always going to be trying to reap what you sow as quick as you can and as much as you can. So the problem is exploration gets put on the shelf. This is what we call sitting back and just saying, what random crap can we get up to here? That disappears. Okay. So there's always a bias towards exploitation, which is a key problem in ambidexterity. So BCG's founder, Bruce Henderson, I thought he made a very valid, valuable comment here, okay? Success in the past always becomes enshrined in the present by the overvaluation of the policies and attitudes that accompany that success. So the general opinion would be, and from Bruce here, is that whatever made you successful in the past, you overvalue it. I think we all know a number of, you know, a lot of people who are like revisionist historians that have been like, well, it was better in my day. No, it wasn't. Okay. You're just thinking that now. Okay. It's just kind of nostalgia is coming in. It was never better. Okay. But it's just the way people overvalue the past. They overvalue things that worked. That's a bias that we all have that we have. And it's not so much that you get rid of it. It's more a case of acknowledging that bias is there. Once you know that you're biased towards the past, you can actually start making more decisions about better decisions about where your company and organization needs to go. So some authors then refer to the bias problem as success syndrome. So where organizations are eventually blindsided by unconventional competitors and technology. So we call this a success syndrome and it's kind of back to this whole thing where it applies to any organization. I suppose one of the things you kind of say is even if you took something that would be a very kind of like established industry like banking, okay? I mean, there's things coming down the line that we can kind of see it happening already where there is unconventional competitors and technology appearing. So it's one of those things that eventually you've got to have some ways of looking out for these things so you can react quickly. Now, the other side as well, people might be thinking, ah, oh, look, I'm in a slow organization, a slow industry here where things are not going to change as massively as I think, as you think there. So maybe you're being a bit over. I can understand if you're in like the electronics industry or something like that, but I'm in a very much like, you know, very kind of slow moving industry. Things are not as crazy as kind of that. Well, the problem there is environmental step changes are not as common as people think. I think over the, particularly, let's say from my generation and maybe the generation before, We've lived through one of the greatest periods of stability the world has ever known, particularly for Ireland, let's say, okay? Like COVID brought an end to that, but it brought an end to one of the longest periods of relative stability we've ever seen. If you go back over world history, there's always some step change happening. I mean, a lot of you could probably think maybe parents and grandparents, well, let's say grandparents for me, 
But if I kind of think about what my grandparents lived through, I can kind of start rattling off, you know, World War One. We can War of Independence, Irish Civil War, Spanish flu. Then you can kind of move up to tuberculosis outbreak. You can move into kind of the Cold War. I mean, there's, there's always stuff going on. There's always crises happening. It's just that particularly for us at the moment, we just haven't had one in a long while. And to kind of expect we won't have one again, that would be very narrow thinking. So this, again, I'm bringing in the argument that exploration, this kind of using some of your resources for that real long-term thinking is, you know, it's not just a nice thing to have, it's a necessity. So continuing with what is it? Look, it is rare, ambidexterity is rare. It's very hard for companies to, you know, there's companies that do it, but it's hard to get there, but it's a necessary thing. OK, and it's, you know, you don't have to be a complete kind of adopting this in a massive way, but it's just to kind of think about, can we bring it in a small way for us? But it is becoming increasingly important now as the diversity of dynamism of business environments increase. So the example I used to prove this is just a very simple one here. When the PC was introduced, it took it approximately 15 years to go from 10% market penetration to 40%. Internet usage, OK, so internet usage kind of, took over market penetration in five years and in smartphone fewer than three. So what you're finding is as new technologies are introduced, they're penetrating the market quicker and quicker and quicker. So the time to react is getting, you know, less and less and less. So everyone loves, you know, on far, like if you look on YouTube right to that, there's always like car crash compilation, train crash compilation, all this. Like everyone, you know, no matter what you think, everyone loves an old disaster story here. So to kind of back this up, before I go on talking a bit more about ambidexterity, we have to look at a few people who fell, or a few companies who look, fell victim to it. So I've just picked some of the kind of classic examples that we would, we would use in kind of lectures and bits and that. First one is Kodak, okay? So Kodak failed, but like, you know, for decades, it was known for its willingness to invest in um, uh, blue skies research okay so it embraced hits to profit when pivoting from back in the day dry plate to film and then black and white to color so it always and this is the mindset it had of it had no problem taking hits to profit because it knew it had to pivot onto something new however at a certain point kodak things change when they invented the digital camera the, the person the chief engineer for the digital camera was from kodak but management feared cannibalizing the existing business. And one of the nicest quotes I've seen in all of this is, the director is telling the engineer, that's cute, but don't tell anyone. Now, you know, that's a kind of good example there, short-term thinking, okay, where you're kind of saying, look, I should look, no one else is going to come up with this, so we'll just keep it in the down low, okay? But, you know, that's just, again, you can see the culture changed. The, the you know, the, the trying to bleed everything they could from existing business became the priority. Now, similarly, we can do blockbuster entertainment. Um, like a similar thing could apply to Extravision in Ireland, okay? At a certain stage, like, geez, there seemed to be a few years there where Extravision were in examinership every other week, but similar blockbuster, there's kind of more information available on what went on there. And like, for people who don't know, they're a former provider of movies and video game rentals. Now, they did not react to the rise of Netflix and on-demand streaming. And the thing people get wrong here is they say, oh, yeah, Netflix just kind of came up with something new. But like Blockbuster had loads of time to react. They had loads of resources. So when you read about Blockbuster and what happened, one of the nicest quotes that sums up the whole thing is, digital did not kill Blockbuster. Blockbuster did. They just ignored it. They were kind of thinking it was something small, like they kind of created a culture of saying, this is not something that's going to challenge us too much. So again, I'm using that word culture comes back the whole time culture and the kind of what's happening within the firm. Final one then I'm going to use is Xerox. Okay, the reason I'm using this one is it was actually kind of um, something I used to inspire the research project that I'm doing that I did um, on, on this. And I'll explain more about where the idea comes from later on how Xerox were so important to my research. But like, you know, some consider their first four copy or the 914 the most successful product of all time. However, their later inventions were shunned by their own directors because they were going to cost too much. They were too far fetched. They wanted to spend most time, more time on kind of refining their other products. Now, what's kind of comical here is they effectively gifted a lot of their patents to Apple and Microsoft instead. I mean, what type of culture has to take over here where that short termism comes in, that long term thinking goes out, the, you know, goes, goes away. 
So you can see these in all these examples that I'm giving, you can see that there's something that is a culture, there's some type of behaviors that have become ingrained. Now it's not just as simple as having a short term, long term, that's, that's easy to say, but hard to do, okay? But just those three examples help explain a small bit where all this is coming from. Now, there's probably people sitting back eating a sandwich, having a cup of tea, and they're like, okay, this all sounds a bit hand wavy. Now, in academia, when we say hand wavy, it's like, oh, listen, settle down a small bit now. Tell us, can you actually do this stuff? Or like, what does this mean? It's all fine to be talking about it, but is there any kind of bit more concrete stuff out there on this? So yeah, look, it is a bit hand wavy. Ambidexterity has a broad definition, and there are plenty of other terms that describe similar behaviors. You have adaptability, you know, like there's loads of things I could use. And the construct has appeared in studies about organizational learning, organizational design, organization strategy, but the key thing is as follows. On an overall basis, the positive link between ambidexterity and performance is robust. So if you take all these studies out there on ambidexterity, they're all saying that the overall organizational performance, there's a positive link between ambidextrous organizations, organizations who are trying to engage in exploitation and exploration, okay, and their overall performance. So there's a robust link there. And that's numerous studies, collections of numerous studies down through the years. So now that we've established that ambidexterity is kind of, you know, I've given it some credibility and I've said, look, here's what's happened in the past and where it's coming from. How do firms actually do it? So you've got four main types of ambidexterity. You've outsourced ambidexterity, you've harmonic ambidexterity, structural ambidexterity, and contextual. Now I'm going to go through these quickly enough because harmonic is, let's say we start with harmonic, that's cycling between periods of high exploitation and exploration. Intel were very well known for this. They'd make something brand new, then they'd kind of say, okay, now we need to refine this, make it efficient for a while. Okay, put on the brakes again, start exploring. Now, the problem with that is there, it's, it requires too many resources and it's too hard to have an organization transformation like that. I'm sure there's a lot of people here in management positions where if you're trying to get through any bit of change management, it doesn't matter how small it is, it can be very difficult. So to, to even think about saying, okay, there's going to be sometimes when we exploit and sometimes when we explore, I just don't find that realistic. Structural then creates separate structures say functions for exploitation exploration. This is kind of like your classic example, okay? So the classic example is where you've got an R&D function. So an R&D function would do all your research and then you've got administrative functions for exploitation. The problem with that is, and I'll come to it in a minute, these two types, exploitation and exploration, okay? They feed each other. So if you're engaging in both, you actually end up with a greater overall result. There's a reciprocal relationship. So if you isolate exploration and exploitation into separate functions, departments, you're actually missing out on the whole thing. From my perspective, that's the way I see it. I'm like, no, no, you have to have both. Then you've got outsourced. That's typically where large organizations farm out work to small organizations that it's got close connections with. Now, again, that's fine if you're a huge organization. You can be the kind of, you can be the, uh, the controller there. You can get these small organizations to do work for you and you're the powerhouse. But for a lot of organizations, they don't have the resources or the kind of power to be able to kind of engage in that. So what I'm interested in then is contextual ambidexterity. And that's where you try and get ambidexterity through behavioral and social means. What I like about it is, look, you're trying to get it, doesn't matter if you're saying, I want my organization to be ambidextrous. Now you can say, I want my business unit to be ambidextrous. I want my function to be ambidextrous. I want my team to be ambidextrous. And finally, I want me to be ambidextrous. And that's kind of what I like about contextual. It's a mindset shift, okay? Now, before we get on to what the studies have, that we've done here and where, how we link it to performance measurement systems, I just want to kind of go back to that point I said about the forming and feeding that the reciprocal benefits of this, okay? I wanna kind of focus on that and just convince you what I'm talking about here. So is exploration really worth it? So some research has emphasized the importance of balancing too. Now straight away, I throw that out the window because there's no way that any organization, as far as I'm aware, can have equal amounts of exploitation exploration. If I came into a finance function now and said, right lads, I want half of your resources to be spent on blue sky thinking, I'd be laughed out the door, okay? So we kind of put that to the side. 
However, other researchers have emphasized the combined effect of exploitation and exploration, that they work together, okay? So that's what I, the, the third point is just kind of emphasizing what I just said, where if you've got a bit of both going on everywhere, there's a real good mix going on and you get the combinative power. So the key point is, if you engage in both, they form and feed each other. So exploration drives more exploitation, that drives more exploration, et cetera, et cetera. And that's your benefit, okay? So just to kind of show you again what I mean by that, imagine we rate our organizations on separate scales of one to 10 for exploitation and exploration, one being low, 10 being high. So if, you're, if you score one for exploitation, you've low exploitation, okay? If you score 10 for exploitation, you've high exploitation. But also now assume that organizations only have limited resources. So the max total of exploitation and exploration does not exceed 10. Now I'm just gonna show you this in a table to show you what I mean, okay? So what you can see here is the total here can only ever be 10 because that's kind of representing that everyone only has certain amount of resources. So here, if you're organization A and you've got nine of exploitation, one of exploration, you get an ambidexterity score of nine because ambidexterity is measured as the multiplication of exploitation exploration. That captures that they actually hit each other and work together to produce a higher overall score. But now look what, look what happens here when you introduce a small bit more exploration and drop down um, exploitation. Suddenly what you get is a jump from nine to 16. And that's representing the combinative effect. Now, as you go on, as you increase exploration, you can see that it drops off a small bit. But what we're trying to say is here, the whole point of this table is a small bit of exploration goes a long way, okay? Because what's going to happen here is if you introduce this exploration, that's going to make you more exploitative anyway. So you're trying to get all these efficiencies. You're trying to be kind of refine things, make things, you know, look for incremental improvements not realizing that by putting aside time for this explorative thinking, looking at random stuff, asking random questions about changing radical processes, that will actually help you get the more exploitation anyway, okay? So coming back to the previous point, like organizations five and five, I just don't see that as being realistic, okay? But that would give you a score of 25. But I think that's say, assuming there's a lot of people from a finance function out here, like, would you be on one for expiration? A lot of you probably say you're on zero. Okay, well, that doesn't work in my formula, but at the same time, it's kind of giving you the point where, look, by introducing this small bit of resources for this exploration, there's massive benefits can be um, reaped from it. So Dane, overall, Dane, how do you foster this ambidextrous culture? And one of the key ingredients that comes back is employee autonomy. Okay, that's one of the key things that's coming back time and time again, that giving power, okay, to your um, employees. Now, three examples of organizations that would generally be renowned for this, you'd have Hewlett Packard, Johnson & Johnson, and ABB. So ABB are an engineering company um, based in Sweden. And I know a lot of people might be thinking about Hewlett Packard going, oh, didn't they have bad results there a couple of years ago? And I'm like, yeah, fair enough. But long term, they're just an example of a company that keeps reinventing itself. Do you know? And there's a lot of things these three companies have in common, okay? One of the things is they seem to have far more business units or profit centers than other equivalent companies, right? So employee autonomy is a key thing here. So the logic that they seem to have is they keep units small. So employees feel a sense of ownership and take responsibility for their own results. Added to these small units, so they have numerous profit centers. I know there's a lot of kind of reporting accountants rolling their eyes here saying, oh, geez, there's more month in reporting coming out of this one, okay? But added to this, there's a relatively small number of higher level or hierarchy level in these organizations. So the ambidextrous culture seems to be linked to the horizontal organization as opposed to the vertical. Vertical is where you've numerous different manager levels reporting. Horizontal is where, no, forget all that, more profit centers, uh, less of a gap between um, your lower level employees and your top management. And then there's also a culture of tolerance for mistakes as well. Okay. And just to kind of link in this, one of the things I use myself, it's kind of like the 70 goal. Okay. And the 70 goal is act quickly and be right 70% of the time, then act slowly to try and be right 100% of the time. 
another way of putting that is perfect is the enemy of excellent or excellent is the enemy of good. Okay, so there's a lot of organizations take this approach of, yeah, look, we're going to get some things wrong, but on the, you know, if we're going to be right more than wrong, we're still fine. Now, that needs that culture of tolerance for mistakes because perfection needs the massive problems, which we'll talk about in a minute when we come to uh, the research studies we're, we're looking at. So moving on to the accounting academic studies, uh, the following slides discuss two recent studies on ambidexterity by UCC and NUI Galway, okay? And both studies focus on performance measurement systems and their relationship with ambidexterity. So this just looks at performance measurement systems in terms of uh, like performance measurement systems, what do we call them in, in the academic space? We call them management control systems, okay? And then that's under the broader area of management accounting research. Now there's a lot of kind of, you know, tedious stuff there. I'm not gonna bore people with, but they're generally performance measurement systems. We call them a management control system, okay? And a PMS is any organizational system that specifies financial or non-financial metrics. So whatever you call it in your organization, if you get reporting metrics, KPIs, whatever, if you have a dashboards or if you've any kind of metrics at all, that would fall under our definition of performance measurement system. Maybe it's just kind of in terms of if you're running a small practice and you're just looking at cash collections, that's a performance measurement, okay? So just a very broad definition of this. So what we did, this is the joint UCC and NUIG study with myself and Professor Breda Sweeney, who's the head of accounting and finance in NUI Galway. And the objective of it was to examine the relationship between PMSs and ambidexterity within business functions. So this struck straight to the heart of my thinking that every single function should try to be ambidextrous to some extent. Again, I'm not saying no 50-50, I'm saying no guys, no matter if you're a finance function or a HR function or things we traditionally associate with admin, you need to be looking at this. And the finding was, yeah, we found a positive link between a certain type of performance measurement system and ambidexterity, okay? So we'll talk about what that certain type now is in a minute. What theory did we use? We said that accounting systems can be enabling or coercive. Basically, now, the guy who came up with this was kind of a communist, okay? So it's all about, you know, free the people, Marxist kind of theory and all the rest of it. But I've taken it from my own capitalist means, so it's not too bad. But basically, if you, if you describe a system as enabling, you see users, you see employees as a source of skill and intelligence. That comes back to, you know, you look down the line and you say, that person there can help us. That person, every single person on that floor is a source of knowledge for us, is a source of learning, is a source of exploration. Now, if a system is coercive, the user is a source of problems to be eliminated. And as another research, researcher puts it, coercive system designers would rather you were a robot. They see you as a problem, a source of problems, okay? And you can imagine this in organizations, but I'll, it, it's kind of hard then to say, how does a performance measurement system be enabling or coercive? It's actually quite easy. We'll talk about that now in a second. So if you look at an enabling performance measurement system, they've got four features. Now I want everyone to kind of, if you're, if you're subject to performance measurement systems, just think about your systems from this regard. The first one is repair. That's the ability of function managers to contribute towards the design of their PMS and get drilled down information from the PMS. So if you can contribute to the design of your PMS, and if you're able to get good drill down information on measures, we would call that more enabling. A less enabling or a coercive system would be one where you're not allowed to feed into the design of that performance measurement system. You're not allowed to get any deep information on it. Then you've got internal transparency and that's the level of visibility function managers have over their own functions. So an example of this would be if you measure your function performance in terms of two measures, a more enabling system might have four or five measures. So internal transparency is the more visibility you have over your function, the better, okay? That's the way enabling sees it. And then global transparency is the level of transparency function managers have outside their own function. So for an enabling system, you've got to be able to see beyond your own function, okay? So it's kind of, looking at repair, internal transparency, global transparency, it's opening up the organization to everyone, to function managers, middle managers, senior management. It's basically saying, rather than senior management holding the keys here, you're releasing more information to the whole organization. So if I'm working in function, uh, finance function, 
global transparency would mean that I have more visibility over someone, let's say, working in production or marketing or HR. I've got some access to what they're doing. Finally, then you have flexibility, and that's the extent to which a PMS determines a manager's actions. So how much do you have to work towards that performance measurement system? Okay. Do you have, is everything about the performance measurement system? Doesn't matter what gets done, that performance measurement system has to be right. Okay, you have to work towards that. So if you've got a performance measurement system that's not flexible, doesn't matter, you're going to be judged on the performance measurement system and that's that. If you have a more flexible performance measurement system, you know, you can kind of go off on a solar run every so often if you want. And that's, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the guidance we'd be giving there. So in terms of the findings, and this is where it kind of gets interesting because we bring this into new technology. We bring it into big data discussions now. We find an inverted U relationship. What the hell does that mean? Well, up to a certain point, the more enabling the system becomes, that really helps your ambidexterity. But if the level of enabling gets too high, it actually shoots back down the other way. So this is really interesting for me now because it's kind of saying that, hold on a second now, there's a limit to all of this. There's something else happening. But we are saying, yeah, look, enabling is good. Free the people, give them what they want. But suddenly then, well, hold on a second, there's weird things happening when you, from these, this performance measurement system if the level of enabling goes too high. We also find as well, just as a separate thing, that as the level of enabling increases, functions bias themselves towards exploitation. So the more enabling, this is kind of, if you give a function manager um, an enabling PMS, it's going to help them with exploitation. So if you're a manager out there at the moment, if you're an accountant thinking, I want to exploit more, forget about your exploration, well, enabling PMS is the way to do it. Now, I'll come back to all of this in a second, but basically if we visualize this inverted U, we can just simply see that, you know, I've just taken a subset of data here. You know, as the level of enabling increases, you're getting more ambidexterity, but suddenly it kind of reaches this infection point and things start to take a turn downwards. So it's not like they flatten out. If it was flattening out, you'd say fair enough, but it's actually getting worse. That's more significant. So what are the positives of this enabling PMS? So if you've got a system with repair, repair allows for employee knowledge to be infused into performance measures, making them more relevant and actionable. So if you get your lower level employees helping you design the system, that means their local knowledge becomes embedded in the system. That's a good thing for ambidexterity. And then a lot of research has linked repair to environments that promote experimentation and trial and error. I can't say that one causes the other, but it seems to be that where you've got systems that allow for employees to contribute towards them, there's more acceptance of mistakes, okay? Now, alternative paths then. Increasing internal transparency helps employees to identify new avenues for goal achievement. So if you've got more visibility over your function, just extra metrics coming in, you potentially see new ways of doing things. That's helpful for ambidexterity. And then you've also got improved knowledge flow. So global transparency increases vertical and horizontal knowledge flows, helping functions look out for changes in the task environment and sense opportunities and threats. So you might be a fi finance manager, but if you're seeing data com coming in from the sales manager, that's what we call a horizontal flow. You're getting more knowledge coming in from all sides of the organization. So a vertical flow is basically where the information comes down from senior management, but a horizontal flow is where it starts coming in from different sides to you. So what we're seeing so far is that repair, um, you know, allow is like infusing local knowledge. Internal transparency is just giving you obviously more knowledge of your function, so give you better ideas. But global transparency then is giving you more knowledge of the whole organization anyway. It's stopping you being, you know, a small cog in a very big wheel. And then adaptation. Flexibility then is you do need to leave room for changes in local needs and circumstances. All the research is saying if your system, if your systems do not have some flexibility, you're going to get a lot of bad outcomes from this. So a bit of flexibility goes a long way here. So prior, and then prior research has also shown that managers complement PMS information with our sources of knowledge. So if you're thinking that the performance measurement system is everything in your organization, the research is saying that, yeah, but most people don't make information based on that thing anyway. 
So if you're holding people to account on the, your performance measurement system, you're ignoring the fact that they're not really using it for their real decisions anyway. So they're the positives of the enabling PMS. But now we say, okay, that's fine. But think now about big data. This is all kind of saying more information, more involvement, more work. As the level of enabling increases, we have some problems. There's three of them. One is paralysis by analysis. The other is the transparency paradox. And the next one then is unbridled control. So paralysis by analysis basically means that high repair means users get caught up in the mechanics of measures rather than the principles they represent. So if your employees contribute too much to the PMS, they start talking about how the measures are calculated rather than what the measures are actually saying. So watch out for that. Are you focused too much on how this thing is being calculated, looking for what we call perfect measure? Well, you don't need the perfect measure. No one needs a perfect measure. You need a measure that's accurate enough to help you make a decision. That's far from perfect. But what we found is that if you allow people to get too much drill down information, contribute too much to how the measures are defined, you basically lose sight of what the hell you're meant to be doing anyway. The next one then is called the transparency paradox. Turning everything into data and numbers can remove employees from operational realities. If you've got too many measures, you suddenly start being removed. So you might say, geez, I've loads of transparency here. I can see everything. But what the research is starting to say is, yeah, but that's actually removing you from what's happening on the ground. You're representing everything as a number. This is like in social media where companies like Facebook, they don't call people people, they call them nodes. So they, they're no longer, they're removing themselves from the reality of what's happening. So too much information, think back now to big data where this is all going, having all these measures can actually be distancing yourself more. By getting more transparency, you're actually getting less visibility over what's really happening. And finally, then there's unbridled control, which is basically saying, look, there's some control is always necessary to direct employees. Like as someone said, if you just left people off what they have to do, it was going to be, it, it would just turn into um, a country club atmosphere. So some control is always necessary. So if you've got too much flexibility, well, then people need some direction. I think we all need some level of control up to a certain point. So the project takeaways from this is even the most traditional administration function can benefit from an ambidextrous mindset. All the new advantages of analytics and big data are also presenting new disadvantages. Now, those disadvantages might always have been there, but now we're thinking about them more. Is all this new information actually that useful? It's useful to a point. And do we all want to be controlled up to a certain point? Like you might say, you know, free your workers, blah, blah, blah. But is that really a good thing? You know, there's big questions over that. Okay. At a certain point, you know, and I find myself there when I'm busy doing my own work and thinking of things to do, I just sit back and say, geez, I'd love if someone just told me what to do here. You know, just for, just for today, it'd be fine. So, the next one then, and I'm just going to run through the NUI Galway study. This was a separate one to my study, but in a related um, research stream, was to examine the relationship between performance measurements, task conflict, and ambidexterity at senior management team level. Now, I'm going to kind of go through this kind of highbrow because I'm just conscious of time. I don't want to go too far in this. But again, the NUIG study also said, yeah, performance measurement systems, they're crucial for ambidexterity. So the theory they're looking at is they looked at conflict. And I really like this because, look, conflict in general refers to a clash between opposing ideas. Task conflict reflects the differences of opinion about work-related issues. Contrary to what you might think, professional conflict is an important ingredient for ambidextrous organizations. So this is something that's happening in our generation, in my generation, sorry, I think as well, where it's almost like this thing of, oh, no, no, keep everything quiet. There's no hostilities and all this. And it's kind of saying, well, no, look, this tension, this conflict is actually necessary. So we're always arguing between ourselves, even within our own heads about things. So there is what we call cognitive conflict, which is where you're disagreeing with someone, but you're not holding him against them. Now, the only problem is there's also something called effective conflict where you're taking it personally. So there's a big problem here where cognitive conflict, where we have a productive disagreement is really useful. But effective conflict, do we take it too personally? That's not useful. 
So the theory that was looked at here, many KPIs are used to manage innovation. So return on investment, time to market, patent filings, but these tend to favor exploitative innovations. So the Galway study looked more at the actual measures that were being used. And they said, look, no matter what, when, when firms measure their innovation, they're still not capturing exploration. They're capturing exploitation, the return on investment, time to market, patent filings. They're all examples of exploitation. So what, Gal what the Galway study is, is kind of saying is that ambidextrous organizations need PMS as suitable for exploratory innovations. So an example of this would be headcount or financial resources devoted to exploration number of patents filed for exploratory innovations. So it's just saying to introduce into your performance measurement system some of these out there measures. That's just giving you an idea of where you are with things. So like if you're a small accounting firm, rather than saying, you know, what's your profit increase, you might say, okay, what, what new customers do we have this year? But even then, you know, what new engagements do we take in place in this year? What new style of engagements have we taken place? That's probably a more useful example because it's kind of saying like, if you're a small accounting firm, you might say, okay, there should be some new work coming on stream here as technology changes and as rural changes, how much of that did we grab? So by putting in what we call exploratory, which is, you know, again, the blue sky out there thinking, that's really beneficial to your overall organization. So the findings here, a balanced PMS between exploitation and exploration makes salient the tension between both types of innovation. What it's saying here is if you've got a performance measurement system that has some reasonable balance of exploitation and exploration, that is just going to make the whole organization aware of what's going on. And suddenly exploration won't take a back seat. Now, this is crucial for the virtual environment, the next point I'm about to make. Balanced PMS is not enough you need to combine the PMS with open face-to-face -face debate of the PMS measures. And that generates task conflict, which in turn drive ambidexterity. One of the biggest problems we have right now is face-to-face -face debate is the richest source of information available to anyone. Forget about performance measures, forget about manuals, looking up the internet, debate is the key thing that people can learn from. It's, it, it's, the, it's top of the tree. So are we seeing a decrease in that? And, you know, big data and stuff, are people making decisions on their own rather than actually trashing out the subjective elements with other people? But the, the point that the study is trying to make is, look, don't try to resolve conflict, use conflict. Don't be saying, oh, this is, this is great. You know, I don't like arguing with this person or I don't like when these arguments take place. You've got to accept that a lot of these arguments, a lot of these discussions, when they're professional, are unbelievably useful to the organization. So don't be trying to say, remove the tension. It's actually a case of, no, that tension is gonna keep you going. So the project takeaways from the Galway one, now don't confuse cognitive conflict, which is constructive, brilliant, with effective conflict, which is destructive. Now the problem is both of them kind of occur together, but again, that's an organization mindset. Don't take it personally, or just say, realize that constructive cognitive conflict is going to help you. Okay, and it's like trying to, a lot of people at the moment trying to diffuse tensions, kind of reduce emotion levels, open up kind of the organization. But the problem is a lot of these tensions is where the good stuff comes out of. The biggest point that I think is relevant to everyone is face-to-face -face debate is the richest source of information for employees. And the more we rely on systems, performance management systems, et cetera, et cetera, if we rely on them on their own, there's going to be a problem here where the richest source of information becomes lost. So what does this mean for remote working and increased virtual interactions? Now, in a follow-up study I'm doing, I show that an enabling performance measurement system actually increases face-to-face -face debate as well. That's for another day. But it's kind of thinking that something again to think is that no matter what happens here in terms of organizational learning, debate is still at the top of the tree between people. So what are the overall takeaways, okay, from the whole thing what I've been spouting on about here? Accountants have key roles play in the innovation process because they tend to be the designers or controllers of the performance measurement system. 
And if you can sit back and when you're looking at these conversations, having conversations with people who are using the PMS, just think about those facets of what I'm talking about. Repair, internal transparency, global transparency, flexibility. They're not that easy. They're not that difficult to kind of grasp. And, you know, it's kind of just, just be, be aware of these things and what are going on. Even the finance function should have an R&D budget. You know, it's back to the whole thing where a lot of people are like trying to kind of have new innovations in their finance function. They, they want innovations. They like the idea of something radically different, but it never happens. But until people start devoting actual time and resources to making them happen, it's not just going to happen organically. What tends to happen is it happens as an act of desperation too late. Not too late, but it happens late as an act of desperation. And again, just remember, too much exploitation just makes you want faster horses. Now, where that comes from is Henry Ford was asked why he never really was one for market research. And Henry Ford's reply was, well, when I designed the Model T car, if I had asked everyone what they wanted, they would have wanted faster horses. When you're exploiting in your finance function or whatever function you're involved in, you've got to remember there's a lot of stuff out there you don't know, and you don't know what you don't know. So you need to find a way that you just get this new knowledge coming in, random stuff coming in, just so that there's an awareness generated and you can start thinking about whether it works for you or not. That's the kind of thing where, you know, a lot of people would argue against lean sing i know like far, i did a lot of the research now i did was with pharmaceuticals and like you know lean manufacturing and six sigma and all that there's a lot of critics of that and the critics would always say that look six sigma lean manufacturing they're brilliant for exploitation but it doesn't really help you take a back seat and say can we do something radically different here so just watch out for that a little exploration goes a long way remember the combinative effect OK, so just to kind of uh, before I finish, I'll be finished in about two or three minutes. What you kind of just to kind of emphasize what I'm saying and something where big data is going. I saw this the other day. I thought it was interesting. That's the current map of Africa and Google Maps. Absolutely. Generally a flawless design in terms of geographical layout and all the rest of it. I want you to compare that map. To a map from the 1600s. The point that the person made to me was, look how rich in information that map is. Do we really care that they haven't drawn the Cape of Good Hope properly? Does, is it enough information for you to operate with? You're like, oh, geez, no, there's a bit of a tail missing there. It's all doomed. But look at all the extra kind of information that's built in. So one of the things to kind of look at is, is big data coming back to more information, more perfection, okay? Is that actually leading us down the wrong path? And that's kind of something we, you know, I want you to kind of take away from my discussion. There's a lot of other stuff I'm into. I'm not gonna kind of spend too long. Frugal innovation is one if you wanna look it up and then open innovation, um, but I'm just conscious I wanna get kind of some Q&A going on this one. So what I'd say, look, if any of that resonated with you, feel free to get in touch. That's my email, mike.farrell at ucc.ie. I'm on LinkedIn as well. And I can kind of send you on more information on the project if you have any interest in that. But I think at that stage, just in the interest of time, Kevin, I'm gonna stop sharing there and we'll just take a few questions. That's great, Mike. Listen, thanks very much for that. It's um, really interesting. I think there's a lot of good food for thought there for everybody that, as you say, it's a kind of high level approach, but I'm sure there's something that everybody, like in all these sessions, if you can take away one thing, I think um, certainly to, to understand uh, the difference between the different aspects of that and the incremental approach and then stepping back and getting maybe, as you say, that blue sky thinking. Um, perhaps just on that, there's a couple of questions there and I'm just conscious of time, so we might just take one or two, but can you maybe just talk a bit more, just say how ambidexterity can be relevant to say finance function, which is probably the most relevant that we have here, which is probably traditionally seen as very administrative and wouldn't really be a major source of innovation. So, yeah. So I think Kevin, this comes back to something the, uh, the Cork, the Chartered Accounts Committee have been talking about recently where we're saying, okay, we want to kind of 
this is, as I said, it's unashamedly um, a high kind of level talk because we want to move towards something now where we look at kind of a lower level operation. I think there's a lot of finance functions out there at the moment where they're saying, we know what we're doing, we're doing it okay, but how do we find out if there's anything kind of new going on there? Like it might be transitioning to a new software system or an upgrade software system. It might be saying like we have a month in process that takes place over this amount of time. But is anyone thinking like, can we actually change that process entirely? We, you know, it's asking bigger questions about why we do things. It doesn't matter, you know, like say, if you look at what a finance function produces, it produces reports, it's business partners with other functions, okay? You can kind of look back at that and say, right, we're always trying to do cost cutting. So a simple example would be trying to cut costs that would be exploitative, but explorative is more asking the question, really asking the question of why do we need that cost to begin with? And it's, you know, a lot of people, that's relative there for them. And one of the things we're looking to do over the next couple of months is we were talking about this, Kevin is saying, it would be great if we could get people maybe from the audience or something like that to kind of, if they have examples of case studies for them where they've actually applied relatively new innovations and in their finance function. At the end of the day, there's a lot of innovations happening in finance and keeping up on them is quite difficult. And, you know, you've got, you've got to make a massive decision when changing systems. But on the whole, because the finance function also deals with so many other functions, if the finance function has that ambidextrous mindset, that can also kind of flow out to the rest of the organization. The opposite can also happen. Whereas if the finance function is what we call kind of old school, very bureaucratic, they can actually impinge other functions an awful lot. Yeah, no, I think that's really relevant. And like, that is something we've spoken about within the committee around, like, I suppose, particularly maybe reinforced by COVID, we all kind of work in isolation now in many ways. And there may be things going on in other, the other, in other industries and other businesses that you may think isn't innovative but somebody else may think is that's a real groundbreaking concept so like one of the things we might do actually uh, as a follow-on from today is i think fiona's going to send out a mail just to the attendees to kind of say look if you have any experiences within your own business or if there's anything that you feel that you'd like to share or maybe things that you think would be relevant for others we'd be delighted to facilitate that in the Cork Society in terms of giving somebody a platform just to maybe share their experiences or perhaps maybe in time as things reopen in the new year and over the rest of this year, maybe have small networking sessions where maybe a few people working in a particular industry or particular area could maybe meet for a cup of coffee and to facilitate that kind of general chat and just, as you say, like the it's often these conversations that start off over a cup of, co cup of coffee will generate out something else that maybe a small group of people can take away. And it is back just to remind everyone there like that exploitation and exploration are relative to every organization. So as you said there, Kevin, you might do something within your function and say, geez, we did this exploratory innovation last year. It was brilliant. But then you might be afraid to talk about it with other organizations because you're saying, oh, geez, they'll think we're well behind. My experience is, yeah, there'll be some organizations that have done what you've done but there'll be a whole other heap of organizations that are looking at you saying, geez, we really need to do this. So, you know, it, it's, it's like, there's going to be a mix of people there. That's what I found the whole time is what's exploratory for you could be exploited for someone else, but it's, it's up to every organization to determine where they're at in that, in that. Yeah. Um, maybe just another question that's come through there is in terms of like, what would be the parameters we can use to encourage that cognitive conflict or just maybe an environment we can set up or, yeah, like so the key thing is, all right, this is the key problem that I was kind of jumping over nicely, but someone has kind of uh, held me back on it. <laughs> the problem is, if you've got cognitive conflict, you're, you're automatically at risk of effective conflict. So it's recognizing, it's setting that boundary of saying to people before we start, you know, I've had it the other day where like, say a friend of mine that I actually have business dealings with, we start off the conversation with, right, before we chat about how everything's going personally, will we get into business mode? And, you know, it's like, it's almost that thing of saying business is business. And one of the things that I'm personally kind of against at the moment is saying there's too much personal chat going on, mixing in with business talk. I mean, one of the things that I feel COVID has shown for me is we're better off to isolate the personal and the business. And I mean, make people, because, you know, Suddenly then, like, if you're having these conversations, you start off with 10 or 15 minutes chatting about how the family is doing and all the rest of it. That's kind of, you're bringing in personal thoughts there and you're kind of, you know, 
it's better to kind of say, right, let's get the business done. Let's put that aside now. How are you getting on after that? Mm. Do you know, so the personal chat is something that if it happens in isolation to the business, the two don't get mixed as far as I'm concerned. I know it sounds funny to kind of say that, but I'm not a big, I believe work is work. And I believe personal life is personal life. I think this thing of trying to mix the two too much is not helpful to people in the long run from a kind of, let's say, a mental health perspective or, mm. you know, as I said, trying to engage cognitive conflict. The way I've always looked at it is, you know, trying to kind of say, set the parameters of the meeting before you start. So we're about to go into this. We'll have a debate about it. Feel free to express your opinions. But by the way, we will leave on the same terms as when we came in. And it's just setting those ground rules, making it kind of salient to people. Like, you know, a lot of people do that for meetings. Like we have it here now in UCC where we've put up a slide every time now, Zoom etiquette. We say, this is acceptable. This is unacceptable behavior. And I mean, that seems to have gone a long way to no, it still hasn't stopped people being on mute or having their dog bark in the background, but you know, there's only so much you could do. It's the joys of, of COVID and the, the, the world we have to work in at the moment. Um, as I say, which uh, I think baby's teddy's behind me on the ground here. <laughs> The joys of using spare rooms. Listen, Mike, I, I think um, we've kind of covered off a lot of questions there. And listen, it was really insightful. I think like as all these webinars and things, if you can take away something from it, and certainly there's quite a number of points I think everybody can take away from today. Um, as we said, look, Fiona's going to send a mail. We would absolutely love any suggestions for people for maybe further events um, or even if you're willing to maybe share your own experiences within the Cork Society, we'd be more than delighted to facilitate that. So with that, Mike, thanks so much for your time. Thanks to everybody for dialing in and um, we'll leave it there for today. So thanks. Cheers, guys.